Welcome back. I'm Peggy Sue Skipper, and I am delighted to be sitting here talking today with Christopher Dunn, who's just come out of speaking at the Unearthing Ancient Civilizations Conference here in Houston, Texas. And uh, we want to talk a little bit now, Chris, about your books. First of all, you kind of burst onto the scene uh, <laughs> with uh, the Giza Power Plant, Technologies of Ancient Egypt. And this book came out again? Uh, 1998. 1998. It was published, yeah. Okay. And what... What was the just? Why did you write this book? Well, I was uh, I was had a lot of questions about the origins of the Great Pyramid, and I noted too that a lot of other people still had that open question about the origins of the Great Pyramid, and um, in analyzing the uh, the structure, I noted that the internal architecture, it appeared more to me to be more of a, like a machine rather than a, a tomb. Like and a machine? It, was, it looked like the schematics of, of a machine. And, you know, I'm used to looking at drawings all the, t all the time, and so I'm like, wow, this looks like a machine. <laughs> all right. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> and uh, then digging in a little deeper, um, I found that there were some really anomalous uh, features of the of the Great Pyramid that didn't didn't really make sense within the context of a tomb. And then it's come to find out that really there were, there have been no original burials found in any pyramid. No bodies ever found in a pyramid, right? Uh, well, there've been there've been bodies found, but they've been were interred there at a later date. Mm -hmm. So the question there's a huge question mark about whether the pyramids were actually tombs. And from a, a you know, from my perspective, the redundancy of uh, materials in, in uh, the pyramid, the uh, complexity of the, the, the shafts and passageways, the size of them, I mean, the ascend supp supposedly ascending passage uh, is only 41 inches square. And, you know, the whole idea of dragging a revered king up a, an ascending passage, and it just doesn't make sense, a lot of the, a lot of the theories. And then the fact that there are three internal chambers uh, when you only need one for a body. But, and the, the, the theory is that, well, he keeps changing his mind. And <laughs> that just didn't make sense to me either. Bringing his entourage <coughs> so, with him, you know. So um, like a lot of people before me, I totally rejected the tomb theory and then uh, started to analyze it to see if I could figure out uh, what it was. And... So I was reading a book called uh, Secrets of the Great Pyramid by Peter Tompkins, and then one night I was reading and the, uh, the light bulb went up, uh, off over my head, and I became consumed with an idea that this thing was actually generating energy, but not, but in a way that was uh, a, l a little different to More what... More organic than what we think well, of today? <clears throat> yes, uh, yes, that it was drawing energy from the earth, uh, mechanical energy, like seismic energy, and so it was being used to draw seismic energy or uh, up through it and then uh, releasing that energy, actually creating, uh, harmonizing the plates of the planet uh, as a primary function, but then converting that energy into electromagnetic energy. And, uh, and that's what I started to actually study to see if there was any information that would support that in the, in the, in the, uh, the Great Pyramid. What I found was that uh, all the evidence uh, that is found there in ancient times and also modern times uh, feed into that, that, that hypothesis or that theory about the, the pyramid being an energy device. It explains this, the subterranean chamber, the king's chamber, both the shafts that uh, lead to the uh, queen's chamber, both the shafts that lead to the king's chamber, also the, the whole structure of the king's chamber, which is made out of granite. And as a note, interestingly, uh, granite could be considered firestone. And if you remember, uh, Edgar Cayce wrote about the mighty crystal or the fire the firestone that right, was right, used right. in ancient Atlantis. So, Okay, so a, let's, <clears throat> first of all, I love the fact, I think all great discoveries begin with an epiphany moment. And yes. You said that light bulb went off. Right. I think that's the way it happens, regardless <clears throat> of what the discovery or the research or whatever. Um, so you had one of those moments. Mm -hmm. So, so tell me what you think this energy that this pyramid was creating, this power plant of a pyramid was creating. What was it used for? What did it do? 
Well, I mean, just like we would, uh, if we had that power source today, we, we, we could uh, use it for many different things. Uh, you know, if we have, we have appliances that we could power, uh, so you're energy. talking about actual something that could be transferred into actual electricity? Yes. Or? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, in a nutshell, the, the converted uh, earth energies or vibration it, it transduced them into electromagnetic energy in the form of microwaves. And that's what the shafts that lead to the King's Chamber and from the King's Chamber were for, is that uh, input signal came in. Um, and there was an energized hydrogen which was created in the Queen's Chamber that uh, emitted that little, the photon and so that carried forth to, through the southern shaft and out. Um, the evidence is all, is all there to support it. I mean, it's very detailed and we don't have enough time right, right, right now to that. really get into it. But <laughs> We've got two whole books here, we can't do it in a <laughs> but the, uh, But the, the evidence is there to actually support the hypothesis and they're actually, they are physicists now working on um, the problem or the, uh, the analysis of, of the structure uh, to see if, uh, if... Is it still generating energy? That's my question. Well, is not it the still a power plant or do you think it's a... A lot of now? people think it is. <laughs> okay. You know, the, uh, I mean, in 1996, uh, an acoustics engineer, Tom Danley, took some measurements inside the King's Chamber. And it, with all sources of uh, energy turned off, his uh, equipment detected a, uh, a hum, the pyramid was humming, it was creating a, an F-sharp chord uh, and it was vibrating at the, the, those frequencies that form an F-sharp chord in the King's Chamber. Uh, but they were infrasonic, they were between 2 and 9 hertz. And what so does that mean? <laughs> cycles <laughs> per second. It okay. means that it, it's, it's below the range of the human hearing. Okay. Uh, you can't hear it, but uh, his instruments picked it up. Interesting. And so that is actually central to the, the thesis, uh, the, the theory in, the, in the, the Giza power plant is that the earth energies are of low frequency, but then they step them up. And that's why the gr they had the grand gallery was to step up those frequencies and drive the, uh, the, the granite chamber to resonance. Which is a technology that we do not have today. We use similar technologies. I mean, you we know, do. just the microphone that you're wearing is a, an example of it, it with a, a quartz crystal uh, because essentially you have what they call the piezoelectric effect where uh, quartz is stressed or it vibrates and that with mechanical energy, which sound is mechanical energy, and then it converts that to electricity. Okay. So. And so your second book, which came out when? That came out in uh, August of, oh no, June of 2010. Okay. Lost Technologies of Ancient Egypt, Advanced Engineering in the Temples of the Pharaohs. Now, is this a continuation of the first book? It's a continuation of a part of the first book. Okay. Obviously, that, well, the first book had the, uh, the power plant theory, but it also brought uh, evidence into the, this theory to support the, uh, the idea that the ancient Egyptians were more advanced than we have given them credit. And so there is a, a, a chapter in this book called Advanced Machining in Ancient Egypt. Uh, and in that chapter I focus on a lot of the artifacts that William Flinders Petrie uh, puzzled over in terms of how the ancient Egyptians were able to do, to create them, I mean, and he noted that some artifacts were had to they had to have used lathes, powerful lathes, um, and also the drilling of granite, uh, where they they drill granite at a, a very very rapid rate of like one hundred thousandths per revolution of a drill, which uh, we don't do that today. Mm. It's <clears throat> it's a, a an incredible feed rate. So those. Uh, kind of anomalies or mysteries um, I, I address in the Giza power plant. Well, some of my conclusions were definitely um, uh, created a lot of controversy. And for the most part, the, the, uh, the academic or the orthodox uh, researchers, they rejected or didn't even discuss the power plant aspect of it. Uh, technologists do, but the uh, academics don't. But they did attack the uh, um, advanced machining and the uh, the means by which ancient Egyptians cut stone. So um, 
I've always said that you know if you've got to listen to your critics and you have to present the best evidence. And so I thought that if I'm if something is going to shift in terms of man's thinking about this ancient culture, uh, I have to get the best evidence and present it in a way that um, is irrefutable. Mm -hmm. And and so that's the when. Uh, I started to write this. It was in 2004 when, uh, when I first visited the temples, and I, when I first visited the temples, I noted that um, there was much more engineering going on in the temples than I had thought. Because, ah, okay. Because so when it's just the pyramids, it's, it's yes. all the artifacts. Well, when I when I first went to Egypt, I just stayed in at Giza. But I wasn't interested in in temples and pharaohs and statues. I was just a Focusing on, on the engineering of the pyramids, but I did go to Memphis, uh, which is near, uh, not close to Cairo, and and I saw the uh, the statue of Ramses at the Open Air Museum there. And even at that time, I noted, you know, this statue of Ramses uh, it has perfectly symmetrical nostrils. Both the nostrils are identical, and the face was perfect. I, I'm looking down at it. I'm saying nobody has identical nostrils like that. There's something going on there. Well, I, I kind of filed that in the back of my mind, and it kind of re resurrected when I went to Luxor and uh, started to look at the uh, the Ramses statue in the Ramses Hall at Luxor. And what I what I discovered there was that the uh, the Ramses statues are more engineered products than the the result of sculptors. And I've consulted with sculptors and showed them my uh, my analysis, and they agree. That that was not a, a, a sculptor's chisel that created these things. It was uh, more engineering and geometry and okay. precision. So, if I'm understanding you correctly, the, the sort of <coughs> bottom line on your research, which has been extensive, mm -hmm. is whoever built these structures, the pyramids and, and some of the other structures, had some sort of technology that was at least as advanced as what we have today and maybe more. Am I understanding that correctly? I would say we don't Am know. Am I putting you on the spot? <laughs> no. I think in some, in some areas they probably were more advanced than what we are. Um, if, if, we, if we knew what they knew, then it wouldn't be such a mystery. That's right. And so, uh, Good way to put it. Yeah. You must be an attorney at heart, too. <laughs> <laughs> No, uh, but I read a book about one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's interesting. I think that's interesting because it it does, you know, if you just look at the facts, then what you come to, and I've heard this over and over again from people who research ancient sites, you get to a certain point in the facts and you, you hit a dead end based mm -hmm. on what we have been told is our history. We locked into a particular mindset that was uh, set down, established in the in Victorian times, and that is really a cultural filter. So we look at uh, indigenous people in what we consider to be primitive right. cultures, and uh, we look at them as not being not quite uh, as high on the uh, evolutionary chain as uh, as superior Westerners. And, and maybe one day we'll have to get off wrong. that high horse, right? Yes. Yes. That is definitely. We have okay. to change our thinking about, about ancient Egypt and start coming up with more reasonable answers. Okay. Thank you so much for joining us. It's been this a has pleasure. Been very informative. And I want to thank you for joining us today. I'm Peggy Sue Skipper, and we'll see you next time.